Okay, everybody smile, say cheese. Cheese. Okay. One, two, three, cheese. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a, it's a great pleasure to welcome you to the VZB uh, for tonight's uh, conversation with uh, Tom Fontana, uh, led by Sir Peter Jonas. As many of you might be at the VZB for the first time, let me just you know, briefly say a few words about uh, where you are. Uh, the VZB is an independent social science research center that has many links to Berlin's universities, but uh, is independent of these universities. It houses some 170 uh, social scientists, um, most of them in sociology, political science, and economics, uh, but we also have a few historians and legal scholars. I'm the director of a research unit on the economics of change, and on, on the fringes of what we do, um, you know, we look at the interaction of uh, economics, humanities, and the arts, and recently we have developed sort of a special interest uh, in TV, because the TV seems, you know, from the change perspective, you know, particularly interesting in the moment where you see sort of radically artistic change that is intertwined uh, with, uh, you know, commercial change that borders on upheaval. Where you are uh, in this room, uh, I should say you are in a courtroom. And uh, I would love to say that people were sentenced to high security prisons uh, from, from here. Uh, sadly, that would be a lie. Uh, this, is, uh, this building is uh, the former Reichssozialgericht, which was uh, installed after the Bismarck reforms um, that provided social security. So this was the court that governed you know, issues in social security. So tonight's format is uh, it's very strict. We have one hour. Um, we will have, at the end, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, and after that, you're all invited uh, for drinks outside. Uh, I should remind you that uh, this is filmed tonight. But now, please welcome uh, Sir Peter and Tom Fontana. Thank you, everybody. And uh, we opened with a, a jingle, so to speak, uh, which was <laughs> another one. Two jingles. One was from the 80s, the mid 80s, just after the mid 80s, and was St. Elsewhere, and it even topped the charts. Uh, it was the lead in to St. Elsewhere, a famous series. And um, about nine years later, 
um, Oz. Tom Fontana, uh, sometimes known by a lot of us nerds and geeks of TV series as the godfather of the TV series. I mean, his career has been immense since elsewhere way back in the 80s, right up until now. And uh, we'll come to those projects. And in 1996 7, he evolved a 56 part series which he wrote himself. I mean, not just as the showrunner, but really wrote nearly all, maybe all the, op uh, the episodes himself, called Oz. Um, named after, the, in a way, the Wizard of Oz. The, there's no place like home, or well, really, <laughs> that you could say that's a motto of the show. And this was a tremendous risk for that time, historically speaking. We're putting it in an historic perspective, in a social science perspective, and an economic perspective. Because when the show came out first, the first episode in 1997, this was just two years before the discovery or the uh, invention of TIFO, uh, T-I-V-O, and then DVD as a medium that enabled us to completely change the way we watch and experience these tales, these stories, these series. And um, it revolutionized it. It was a revolution. Or was it a revolution? Was it a consequence of a revolution that had happened before? Tom Fontana, 1999, you took an enormous risk. Your backers took an enormous risk. Was it vision? Or was it a happy coincidence? Or was it simply evolution? Well, I, I, I think that there's two parts, uh, answers to that question. Um, one is, in terms of narratively, it was uh, an evolution of the kinds of things that I had been working on uh, prior to uh, writing Oz, uh, St. Elsewhere being one, Homicide, Life on the Street being the other, where there was um, an ongoing serialized uh, character development throughout each season. Uh, even though the stories, the murders during homicide or the medical cases during St. Elsewhere were pretty much, uh, well, I was gonna say the murders were solved, but we weren't, the arc detectives weren't that good, so they didn't solve all of them, uh, nor did our doctors save everyone. Um, but at least the case was, seemed, normally had a beginning, middle, and end in that episode. So from a narrative point of view, uh, this idea of following the journey of, of a character or a number of characters in the life of, a, of, a, of an, an entire series, uh, and series by series, I mean in the American sense, the whole, the, all the episodes as opposed to one particular season. Um, but what was interesting about HBO at that moment, um, Chris Albrecht, who was the head of it, head of, the, of this uh, network, which was basically a movie network, you know, showing movies they bought. Um, he decided that they were never going to go anywhere. They were a subscription-based, they are still a subscription-based network. So they needed uh, things to pump life into their, uh, to excite their subscribers. And um, so he determined that, that doing a, a television series would be a good idea. Um, the only thing that he said to me, he said, he said, oh, I want you to do it because I don't know anything about drama and, and you do, so I'm just going to hire you and trust you. And, um, and uh, which of course was on one hand like giving a heroin addict all the heroin he wanted and saying, do what you will and have a good time. And the other was completely terrifying because I was well aware that if I screwed it up, the next writer who came in, Chris might say, well, I trusted Tom Fontana and I, and I got screwed. So, um, so he took a big risk, a big financial risk, but the larger risk was because it was completely serialized, there was no beginning, middle, and end A story, as we call it, in, the, in any of the episodes, they just sort of tumbled along, there were 30 regular characters, they just, you'd see maybe a minute one week of one of them and 20 minutes of the, that same character the next week, depending on, on where that particular character was in his or her journey. So, um, 
so this idea of doing a purely uh, serialized uh, series was sort of crazy, and um, especially pre, uh, you know, uh, DVD and pre uh, all, you know, being able to buy it whenever you want. Um, and what Chris did, which from a purely business level, and I had no uh, 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 participation in this decision, was unlike uh, the American broadcast networks where they would air a show, let's say, in September, and they might air it again in the summer. Chris's idea, since he only was going to have one original program, was to air it 10 times within the course of the week. So if you missed an episode, or if you didn't know anything about the show but then found out, somebody said to you, have you seen this crazy prison thing on HBO? You could, you could still catch up to it, you know? And, um, and that turned out to be a hugely successful thing for them, uh, both for our show and then uh, shortly after that, The Sopranos, when The Sopranos came to them. Sure, and uh, for those people who haven't seen ours, I mean, there's many people here who have, <laughs> Um, it's, it, it all takes place in a prison, and the majority of it takes place in, in one very confined box in a prison, a, a maximum security unit which is led or managed in a different way, trying to, to seek enlightenment for the prisoners. And this was also a risk from Chris Aldridge and yourself, I mean, because it's sort of modeled on Greek tragedy. You know, that sounds pretentious or high-flying, but... Um, it is the only TV series of its kind at that point, and maybe since, that has a Greek tragedy chorus, which is embodied in a, a character who's in a wheelchair and who begins every episode with a commentary and then com carries on commentaries throughout the episodes interspersing the action. So um, you have a theme of redemption. You had... Uh, a phrase which is written by you, actually it comes from the script, we are, we are merciful because we want to be saved. Um, um, a sinner can't admonish another sinner, so there were all these sinners, or at least condemned sinners, or uh, judged sinners in a box. And um, uh, this redemption, saving lost souls, it's a very, it's almost liturgical. It has a lot to do with great Greek tragedy, and it's confined in a confined space, which comes claustrophobic. It's opened up when they go into the cafeteria. It's opened up when they go into another box, the hole where they go into solitary confinement. So these were enormous dramaturgical risks inside an economic risk. Well, I was coming, you know, I was coming out of working in broadcast television, which um, the reality is today that if I went into a broadcast network and pitched St. Elsewhere or pitched Homicide, they would never put it on the air. It's, it's, it's almost too uh, edgy for them. But what was, what was uh, in terms of this idea of redemption, because in the American justice system, of which I have a slight problem with, um, uh, we go through periods of retribution and then we go through periods of redemption. And what I wanted to see was this sort of, uh, put it in a fluctuating way. But the thing about redemption, the big, the big lie that uh, at least American episodic television does is that the lead character meets a man who is, let's say, an alcoholic. And through the good graces of, the, of our lead character, this alcoholic, at the end of 42 minutes, says, I will never drink again, and goes off into the sunset, and you go, isn't that great? He's never going to drink again. Well, as far as I've seen in my life, that kind of thing takes a lot longer than 42 minutes. And what was wonderful about this gift that I was given to write this insanely violent sexual show was to embed it with this idea of redemption is very tough. And redemption isn't something that happens and then it's done. 
Redemption is something that happens and has to be renewed practically every day of your life. You know, if faith has to be renewed, you, you know, uh, 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 all this stuff takes work. And I didn't, I was so happy to be able to do a series about uh, primarily men, but, but the women, there were women working in the prison as well, who had to struggle and uh, with this, uh, not some, because, you know, not, not everyone is aware uh, as, a, as a New York television writer that we should all be aspiring to be redeemed or whatever. A lot of people live in the, in, in, uh, are sleeping through their whole lives, are in darkness through their whole lives, but they have this instinctive need to, to, uh, to find a better moment in their lives. And so it, it couldn't be articulated, which was the whole idea of, of having the Greek chorus, which was really only one guy, but um, was for him to be able to articulate things that a, a, a man in a prison probably didn't know the words, didn't have the words, even though he may have been feeling it. Um, so that's how that, that part of it came about. Um, ours is about many people, and um, many redemptions, and many situations where redemptions are, are, are a journey. But it's, it's, there's one key character in particular, and that's um, Beecher. Hmm. Tobias Beecher, uh, just for those who don't know the series, is a an affluent lawyer with children and family living in the suburbs, and uh, he makes a mistake in his life, um, a, a drink-driving mistake, and he gets uh, condemned and sent off to the maximum security prison because he killed somebody. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, Well, he killed a little girl, girl. and yeah. so the publicity of it was, forced him yeah. to be punished to the extreme. Right. Yeah. And he, he changes. When you meet him, you've got this creature from outer space, as far as the prison is concerned. Right. And he arrives, and somehow, during these 56 episodes, he achieves redemption by becoming a better person, but not in the sense that the ordinary American public, or even today's television public, would understand. I mean, he, he becomes, he has a different moral constellation. Mm -hmm. He starts to recognize that in order to survive, he has to um, engage in rough homosexual activity, submit to rape, first of all, and then navigate his way through the sexual politics of violent criminals in a, in a male prison. And that he has to defend himself by being aggressive himself, culminating in the fact in the very last episode um, where he accidentally, in inverted commas, or fortuitously, in inverted commas, <laughs> kills the two great nemeses in his life, his lover, who's a murderer, and his real arch enemy, Schillinger. Um, and he leaves, like everybody else, that the last episode is called Exeunt Omnes, like a Shakespeare folio play. <laughs> um, um, and he leaves with a smirk on his face. And you're left wondering, moral compass in this artificial political economy situation. Uh, Beecher, you. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I wanted a character. I wanted a character that, um, for the, you know, uh, basic HBO subscriber, could serve as a, as a, a guide. But um, the the fun thing about writing Oz was, as soon as I created a situation where the audience would feel comfortable with one character. I either killed them or had them do something that was so horrific that you had to go, oh, well, wait a minute. No, I don't want to follow him. Is there anybody else? And so you were constantly having to look around, and which is, you know, in, in prison what you have to be doing. I wanted the audience to feel the same sort of uh, lack of comfort that you feel in, in a real prison, um, or as close to as you can get. Um, but with Beecher, what I, what I was uh, ultimately going for, what I, you know, he was where I started in my head the series and where I knew we would end, was um, I wanted him to be, as you say, redeemed, but in a way in which um, the audience would be 
argue about whether it was redemption. But, you know, it, 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 for me, it's not important for me to uh, preach to an audience. I'm, I don't know, actually know enough about the world. I'm asking as many questions as everybody else is. So my job as a, as a writer for television is to get people to argue about where things go and where things end up. And um, a class, I'll tell you a very quick story. A classic example was of two friends of mine, husband and wife, um, were watching the show. They were in the bedroom. The, they were in the dark, but except for the TV, something hideous happened. The, the wife said, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. And the husband turned it off, and they sat in the dark. And she said, okay, turn it back on. <laughs> and I went, well, at least you said turn it back on. I don't mind you turning it off. I, but I, if you left it off, I would have. And they would argue the end of every episode. They would get into these wonderful uh, arguments about who was right, what was right. And so I felt like that was doing my job. And you are a Catholic. Well, you were, you half were assed well, Catholic. <laughs> um, yeah, OK. You could either say that you're a half assed Catholic or a, you could say you're a collapsed Catholic. <laughs> um, 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 but you know, your, your upbringing in that very, uh, those of us who had that kind of similar upbringing, know that this is a very determining situation. Mm -hmm. You were brought up by Jesuits, you went to school, Jesuit school, and um, in Buffalo, and uh, um, it, it informs your work very significantly. I mean, if we look at the catalog of your work, it's from St. Elsewhere right up to Borges, which we're gonna to come to in an economic context in a minute. Um, what has it given you, culture, discipline, work ethic, uh, I would say discipline. The Jesuits were very good about, um, like, for example, if you disobeyed, which I might have done once or twice in my, in my years at the, at the school, um, you were sent to this thing called jug. And jug is basically where you sit in a room for hours writing the same sentence over and over and over again. Now, obviously, when I was in high school, uh, you know, a teenager, this was punishment. But when I became a writer, which was not long after that, this actually became the way I, I work. I get up at 5 o'clock every single morning, hungover, post-coital, whatever you want to, whatever idea you want to think about, and I get up and I sit down and I start writing. And I may write for 20 minutes, and I may, may write for 12 hours. Uh, I, I, whatever is, goes on, uh, goes on. So I got that from the Jesuits, though I, don't, I doubt they actually anticipated me then writing Oz or Borgia as a result of the punishment. I'd probably be sent back to Jug now if I went to, to the visit the school. The other thing that I did get for them, and, and I, uh, when I was in, in high school, it was right around the time of the Vatican Council. Uh, which was a time of great um, liberal thinking in the Catholic Church. And um, I had several young Jesuits um, uh, who really, what they taught us was to question and ask and think and argue and not just accept blindly anything, including faith. And so that was the other thing I got from the Jesuits, um, uh, was this idea that it is, you know, which was only fed by the fact that then I was in college during the great, you know, uh, upheavals of the Vietnam War and civil rights and women's rights. Um, so it only fed that Jesuit ability to ask questions only was fed into this, this other, you know, events that were happening in the, in the world. So um, that's, that's what I got. Um, one of the reasons Stefan and I asked you to come here for this workshop, and by the way, those who just come for this presentation now, um, half the people here are in, in the middle of a workshop. This is uh, one of our sessions in a workshop. So we've been in the room next door discussing economics and TV series, and this is just the next thing which we decided to open up to the public. 
The drinking but, after that's the more important thing that's coming. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, but one of the reasons is that, you know, I'm going to jump now to 2011, uh -huh. where you started... Like life. <laughs> yeah, where you started to work on and make and a series that has now come out and one more series, one more episode, series of it is coming. Two have already appeared. Borgia, which is actually a series about Rodrigo Borgia, the Borgia Pope, but it's also a series about business, about economics, about social science, about the creation of a firm. I mean, that's the way I see it. Um, it's about grabbing the papal crown. It's about a family business, about setting up your family in the business and shunting everybody else out or murdering them or whatever. It's an economic model, and of course it's true, by and large. The Catholic Church is probably the most efficient and best and the most long-lasting economic business model that we know about. And it's a massive costume drama, the series, uh, of highest quality, internationally produced with something like, I don't know how many uh, producers and countries involved. But it's a story about economics and power essentially. And it has parallels to our time. I mentioned to you, and I think, I, I, I admit that you and I have rehearsed this. I mean, I said to you yesterday in a nice coincidence, it's actually not just about Borgia, it's about Rupert Murdoch and his family. It's about Bill Gates and his family. It's about Steve Jobs and the Apple family. And none of these people or concerns, Borgia, Gates, Apple, Jobs, Murdoch, are bad people. Some of them have got very bad aspects to them. None of them are wholly bad, and none of them are wholly good. And neither was Rodrigo Borgia. So did you, did you set out to make a, an economic business series? I, I, I wanted to do, you know, there were two series about the Borgia, one with Jeremy Irons uh, that was on, I don't know what it was on here, but it was on Showtime in America. And mine was on Canal Plus and ZDF and Netflix. Uh, and um, uh, that one was like, this is the beginning of the mafia. Well, as far as I'm concerned, Francis Ford Coppola told that story too well for me to try to get into it. And I, I really wanted to tell the story of a corporation. And as you say, the Catholic Church is probably the longest lasting a corporation in the history of mankind. And the reason, I think, is because unlike anything else, that any other corporation uh, that is selling something, you know, Nestle's Quick or uh, Tires or uh, Apple Computers, Catholic Church, the brand of the Catholic Church is salvation, is eternal life. Now, you can't get anything better to sell than that. <laughs> there just isn't any. You can't go, well, yeah, but what about? No. Eternal life. I want some, you know? So, um, so that, with that is sort of my, OK, here's this corporation. And here's this incredible product and ha that keeps generating huge sums of money. Um, once you go into the period and you actually research the Renaissance, and this was early, early Renaissance. This was uh, pre what most of us think of as the Renaissance, just as mankind was sort of coming out of the ooze and going, oh, oh, there's, you can paint and things, um, was that this was a man who was, Rodrigo Borgia was a man of his times. He was not, uh, pure evil in a, in a, in a, in a heavenly period of time. When you look at just taking the Italian dukes, uh, uh of the period, each one is complete, it's, it's wildly worse than any of the Borgia. And when you expand it to what was then France, what was then Spain, what was then Germany, what was then England, the behavior of the 1%, as we call them in America, was despicable for the most part. 
And yet there was this rebirth of the notion of family, which had been long dormant during the Middle Age, during the Dark Ages. Um, and so to me, that felt like the way to tell the story of, uh, uh, I, ne I never p sat and thought about it purely on, as an economic story, but I did think of it as a capitalist story. And um, so that's where, that's, that's what was the whole underpinning of the, of the, of the life of the show. And the parallels to Murdoch are quite vivid. I mean, I mean the, 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 the scenes where he, he, he installs his family members mm -hmm. and then shoes out in one way or another a lot of cardinals and then appoints a whole host of other cardinals from different walks of life. So you get a lot of kind of um, uh, uh, crossover product people who ca come in and take over divisions of the church. It's, yeah. it's quite remarkably similar to what Murdoch has done and what... And, and where he's come unstuck yes, in certain yeah. areas. And, and, and like you said, it, it, this wasn't me being creative. This was, this was almost reported, you know? It's, all, it's history, it's not, I, I did invent some stuff just to fill in the, the blanks, but for the most part, this is the history of this family and the church at that time and Europe at that time. Of course, the history can be looked on in many different ways and, and you, you've, you've colored it in, mm -hmm. you know, like, um, not like painting by numbers, but yeah, <laughs> colored it in in a very good way. And being a, a scholar yourself, you've taken um, these these fictions that are in, infused with the facts I mean, by Della de Rovere, the the Cardinal Della Rovere, who then becomes in what we know as the Renaissance. I mean, uh, the commissioner of the Sistine Chapel comes, he becomes Pope Julius II, right. and he dug up to discredit his predecessor Rodrigo with letters about what they did and what they didn't do. And some of these were fictional and some he, weren't. Yeah. Yes, he hired, he hired writers, guys like me, to either completely invent um, uh, lies about the Borgia family or to take some small incident and, and make it a lot worse. And they, he printed these pamphlets. They weren't just letters, they were pamphlets that were sold and distributed, not just in Rome, but throughout, throughout Europe. And it got to be like reading a really sexy, I don't know, uh, 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 you know, uh, some, I can't think of any cheesy sex novelist right now, but you can probably fill in the blank yourself. <laughs> Fifty Shades of Grey. I, I haven't read it, but I'll, I'll take it. I'll take that as the example. I'm going to jump now to, to uh, 1993 to 1999, uh -huh. where uh, you did a series called Homicide. Now, mm. a lot of people here who don't know Homicide, well, they know The Wire. You know, it's won all those prizes, and everybody talks about The Wire and Baltimore and so on. And there's the just as good, and in my view, from Los Angeles, The Shield, mm -hmm. which was also very tough and very interesting. And, but of course, Baltimore, the innovation of doing this in Baltimore, okay, okay they did it with a, an old Etonian English actor, but um, <laughs> um, uh, um, um, a member of the P David Cameron Club. Um, um, but you were doing this in 19, 1993 to 99, Homicide, an enormously long series about a bunch of competent and not so competent detectives who were described by one studio as, why don't you change the cast, Tom? They're, they're all so unattractive, mm. you know? Um, and um, it it's, it's, was an enormously innovative series in terms of the technical work, but also the role of police justice in a city. Could you? Well, it, it, it um, uh, first of all, my business partner is Barry Levinson. And if you know Barry's work, he's a Baltimore boy. And he was sent this book, a uh, nonfiction book, called uh, Homicide a Year in the Killing Streets. It was written by, at the time, a very unknown newspaper reporter, David Simon. And uh, Barry was sent it as a feature, and he read it and said, oh, no, this is a television series. The problem is Barry had never done a television series. So he, uh, they started looking around, and, and we met. And he said to me, I want to do a cop show with no gun battles and no car chases. Now, I grew up watching cop shows with car chases and gun battles, and I said to him, that's impossible, I'll do it. Because it seemed so incredibly muddle-headed to attempt it 
that I wanted to be a part of it. And I figured we'd shoot six episodes and we'd be out of it. Um, that little did I know it would be six years. Um, but uh, from, a, from a, uh, a narrative point of view, what we also decided, and this was, to me, the greatest uh, cop show was Hill Street Blues. And we were doing, Hill, we were doing St. Elsewhere uh, while they were shooting Hill Street. We were literally the writers shared a building, so we were always running up and down stairs yelling at each other. And um, I just thought Hill Street could not, nothing could be better than, than Hill Street. And I'm not saying that homicide was, but we used that as a launching pad to say, well, where else can we go with, with a television cop show? And one of the things was we wanted, as I joked about earlier, we wanted our guys not always to close the case. Because if you read David's book, which I suggest you do if, if you're a fan of David's at all, it's a wonderful piece of reporting, um, is, it, is, it is a mess. Murder is a mess. It's a, a, a murder investigation is a mess. And, um, and what we thought, well, if we can convey the mess of it, then we're being more true to these the lives of these men and women who actually are out there every day facing a dead body. Because that was the other thing that we started with. I get up every morning at five, but I'm facing a blank piece of paper. They get up every day and face a mutilated body or some, some I mean, a, 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 something none of us will actually want to see ever. They see it every day. And at that particular time in Baltimore, the chances of a young black man being murdered on the streets of Baltimore were greater than if he stormed the beach at Normandy. Okay, just give you an idea how many people were getting killed in Baltimore when we got there. Uh, fortunately, no one was killing television writers at the time, so <laughs> uh, I managed to escape. By the way, I checked that. That's fact. Yeah. That is fact. That yeah. little, um, um. Um, so, so, so that was part of it, but the other part of it was the economics. And um, we were working f with NBC on the show, and um, one of the things that NBC uh, really didn't want us to do was spend much money. So this became an, an, a, a, a real example of how Necessity is the mother of invention, and really wonderful things, at least from a creative point of view, can come out of the restrictions. You know, I used the example the other day. Writing, writing Oz was like writing an epic poem. Um, writing Homicide was like writing a haiku. The rules were incredibly small, but you could still try to create something remarkable within the very small framework of a broadcast television show. So, um, so we, set about, we set out to try to do this uh, as inexpensively as possible without it looking cheap. And, um, and so every decision we made was both creative and financial. Now, Barry decided, because he was a feature director who was coming to television for the first time, that we would only have feature directors directing these episodes, which appalled me because feature directors are used to taking all the time they need and just shooting and shooting and shooting. And when you're shooting a television series, you have a very limited amount of time. Well, well, this idea that we did the whole show handheld, and there was never a perfect master. We would shoot it this way, we'd shoot it this way, we'd shoot it this way, we'd shoot it this way. The actors never had to go sit in their dressing room while we were relighting. We just lit it, we shot it, and um, we, we stole from the French uh, jump cutting. Um, uh, we, we made use of, of everything we could possibly make on a creative side to, um, to compensate the fact that we, were, we didn't have the kind of money that later NYPD Blue had uh, or even The Wire had. Um, 
The, the very quick example of that was we, we were only, we were only uh, originally supposed to do six episodes the first season. We ended up doing nine or 12, I can't remember. But anyway, so now I'm looking at the writing the first six and or designing the first six and I'm thinking I'm gonna have movie directors so I'm gonna be in so much overtime, I'm gonna have, it's just gonna be from a nightmare. So I decide that for the sixth episode, I'm gonna write a piece called, uh, well, it doesn't matter what it was called, but it was the entire episode took place, or 90%, 99% of the episode took place in the interrogation room. And it was basically three actors, two of our regular detectives and the suspect of a murder that they had been investigating for the full previous five episodes. Um, We shot it, uh, uh, and uh, make a very long story short, we shot it. I was nominated for the Emmy, and I won. And as I was walking up to get the trophy, I thought, I, I wish these people knew that this was as much about commerce as it was about art, because it really was the kind of symbiotic moment where these two things came together, for me at least. So that brings me to how it happens and, and why TV series really are the logical successors in our society of Charles Dickens, of mm. telling the story in episodes. And um, I mentioned this before in this very room with, with Vince Gilligan of Breaking Bad. Um, you know, it's, 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 it's Amazing to think that way back in the time of Dickens, people waited on the street corner for the pamphlet of the next chapter to come out mm -hmm. and didn't even think that it would come out as a book. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, we talked about how you know, when Transatlantic Passage came, people would go down to the New York Harbor and wait for the latest chapters of the Dickens books to arrive in New York at the harbor. One, one time, a uh, New Yorker yelled up to the captain, how's little Nell? <laughs> so, yeah. uh, Tony Agge from the BBC, who's one of our delegates at the workshop here, was talking about, you know, reading, writing, the difficult processes for the mind, and, and uh, nowadays we have different ways of receiving these tales, you know. With, with, with television and with video and with uh, on-demand and binge viewing, this wonderful new phrase in language. Um, um, do you see there's a sense of social responsibility in being the, the Dickens de nos jours? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I can't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 I think because of everything, I mean, my first job was at St. Elsewhere, it was MTM uh, Enterprises, which was a very, did a lot of both comedies and dramas that really were rooted in, in issues mm -hmm. and, and thought-provoking things. I, to me, it's the thing that I've been doing pretty much my whole career. I just think now that I'm of an age and have, um, uh, you know, achieve whatever I've achieved, um, I have an obligation to pass that on and to, in, and to encourage young new writers to take risks as well. Um, to, to, to really, the minute that a network says to you that's not, a, that's not, not an issue we want to deal with is, the, is when you have to redouble your efforts. Um, uh, and I'll, I'll give you another quick, very quick example, all the way back to St. Elsewhere. The showrunner on St. Elsewhere was, was uh, the wonderful Bruce Paltrow, uh, more known now as the father of Gwyneth, but uh, he, he actually was a human being in his own right. And um, we wanted to do, uh, the writers uh, wanted to do a show about testicular cancer. Um, because we, well, we were told by the network, absolutely not, in which, in which a young college man came in and was diagnosed and had to lose one of his testicles. And we were told by NBC this, under no circumstances will we allow this. Under no circumstances. Well, Bruce, I mean, we went whining and crying to Bruce. Uh, 
you know, and he called up the head censor and he said, look, just before I call the New York Times, let me ask you this question. In last week's episode, we performed a mastectomy on a woman. And you guys didn't have any problem with that. So is it NBC's official policy to be able to cut off a woman's breast but not a man's ball? I just want to get the quote so I can tell the New York Times. Well, needless to say, we got to do the story. But the best part was they said, OK, you can, you can do the story, but you cannot use the word testicle or any euphemism for a testicle. So Bruce then goes to, and goes, look, so, th so that doctor who's, you know, a, a respectable doctor is supposed to go, young man, you have a problem. Uh, where, doctor? Um, in my chest? No. Nope. <laughs> lower. In my stomach? No. Lower, lower, lower. I mean, it, it was like, a, it, it would have been like a Benny, Benny Hill episode or something. So uh, we were allowed to say testicle twice. So if you ever see that episode, you are watching earth-shattering television. The best part was, now this is again before the internet, before all that stuff, we actually got bags of mail. They, you know, like, ah, boom, here's your mail. <laughs> NBC was so terrified the night this episode aired the first time that they had extra operators on and they were, they were like gearing up for this onslaught of negativity. I don't know how many negative things they got, but the bulk of it was positive to the point where a young man, because we talked about self-examination as we had when we did the, op the episode with, uh, t with breast cancer, young man had done a self-exam, found a lump, went to the doctor. It was testicular cancer. He had it taken care of. And he wrote to us to say, watching your show saved my life. And those are the kinds of things you go, all right, well, then just shoot me now, because it's, uh, I, I don't know what's going to get better than that. I've got two more questions, but then I want to open it up to the public, because right. we're yeah. getting into time. We're doing time -wise. But um, you, know, you mentioned here the, the networks. I mean, as I, as I always say, they have the most network executives, have the most remarkable talent for recognizing innovation and surprising artistic possibilities. And they have an even greater talent of hitting them on the head <laughs> and, 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 and stopping it. Um, you've once said that the, the, the business is in a, a, a state of nervous breakdown. Yes. Uh, are the networks in a state of nervous breakdown? Are they in a state of nervous breakdown because so many movies directors want to travel over to series? Or are they in the state of nervous breakdown because they're worried about HBO and Netflix? Or because they're worried about the whole gulf between networks and, and the other providers is going to disappear? It, 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 it's, it, they're worried that they don't know how to make money yet on all of the new media. Mm -hmm. They haven't figured out a way to cash in on it. So they're in this bizarre position of still writing the check to make programming, and yet they don't know if they're really ever going to see any more money for it. Right now, everything's OK for them. But uh, these are not stupid uh, people running these networks. Leslie Moonves, who runs CBS, is, is truly one of the great businessmen, not just in the media, but he is a great businessman. You should have him up here at some point. Um, they're going to figure it out, but in the meantime, they are terrified. And what's great for a writer is they still need me. <laughs> no matter what this shakes down, they still need writers. So I'm like, you know, yeah, I hope you guys figure it out. Boy, I'm really. <laughs> I'm with you. Tom Fontana once said, uh, the only reason to do anything at all is if it reflects the world we live in. Um, well, that's what it used to be. And um, these days, anything goes. Um, 
Netflix releases the whole season at once, uh, green-lighted by an algorithm. <laughs> and um, that's how we got uh, Coans, which it turned out to be very bold, Orange is the New Black. Mm -hmm. So where from here, in, in two sentences? You mean... Uh, where from here? Well, I'm still hoping I'm going to get into the lobby for a drink, but if you're talking about television uh, or whatever we're going to have, I, I don't know. All I can say is, and, and I, when I started in television, there were three networks in America. Three, not even Fox. There were three networks. So that's how old I am and how long, how much the business continues, has continued to change over the course of my career. It only gets more exciting. And I'm not one of these people who wishes I was 20. But if I did, only because I want to see what happens next. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I think those of you who are just starting out in the business, you have, you're going to go places where we can't even, I mean, I would be uh, pretentious to even predict where it's going to go. But it, to me, it's so exciting because the possibilities are endless and they still need the writers. So as long as they need the writers, it's all good. So on that note, only two minutes late, so questions. <laughs> yeah. Can you stand up? And oh, yeah, please. Um, I have two questions, uh, short questions. Um, I would like to ask you, there's a debate in Germany because we have this thing that the German series are not so good and not perceived as well as the mm -hmm. uh, American or British series. Uh, what do you think, what is better if there's just one writer or a team of writers? What do you personally experience? What is better for the outcome of, yeah, that's the first question. And the other thing is, there's also, uh, every once in a while, a criticism that people say, okay, now we have all these interesting TV series. We had serial killers, people with psychopathic whatever. I mean, you, you had it all. That's, that's, that's a feeling some people have. Do you think that the peak, the climax of the uh, success of TV series is already has been there? Or what do you think? Or are there still lots of possibilities we haven't even seen yet? Well, to answer the second question first, because I can remember that, um, I, I, um, I think television is cyclical, though the circle gets bigger each time. Um, and I think that, I mean, it, it, without sounding like I'm trying to take credit for it, Oz was the first show that had no heroes. And, um, and so what we're seeing with Sopranos and Mad Men and Breaking Bad and House of Cards and on and on and on to, to where we are today is this sort of rise of the anti-hero. Um, uh, uh, I truly believe that it will peak and that we will swing back around to wanting John Wayne, you know, wanting a good guy to come in riding a white horse and saving us all from ISIL or whoever, El Ebola, whatever is out there, you know. And um, so I do think it'll, it'll come back f for a while. The problem is that now, at least in America, all the networks go, but he has to, he has to have a major flaw. I mean, what, can, what, else can he, what else can be wrong with him? And you go, <laughs> Uh, you literally go, I, I don't think there's anything left. You may, he could maybe be a kleptomaniac. That's, I don't think anyone's done the great kleptomaniac <laughs> drama series. But other than that, I, I, think, you're, I think you're lost. Um, the first part of the question, oh, was I could see? Mine does work. Um, there are two schools of thought about, uh, the one is, in my mind, is, is wonderful writers like David Milch, Aaron Sorkin, who really, even though they have staff, they really write the whole thing themselves. And the only thing where I've done that, and it didn't do it all, all of Oz myself, but I did the bulk of it myself. The only reason I did it that time was, first of all, we were doing eight episodes a year, which was a manageable amount as opposed to 22 or 25. But the other thing was, I found that as I would be hire a writer to write an episode, 
I'd have to start to describe these things that I was going to ask this person to write. <laughs> so I'd go, you know, and then he takes him into the, and he pull, bends him up, and he goes, I'll just write that scene. <laughs> yeah, I, you don't need to write that scene. I'll just write that scene. It's, it's, it, I know it's in my head. I'll, I'll, just, I'll just write that scene. So that was the reason I did it on Oz. Everything else, I think if you're going to create a universe, um, and this is, again, personal opinion, you need a diverse number of voices in, in, the, in the writing staff. And so you need men and women. You need white, black, Asian, Latino. You need um, young, old, um, experienced, inexperienced. Um, so that you're, my job then becomes like I'm like an, a conductor of an orchestra uh, trying to get the violin to play at the same time as the tuba. You know. That's it. It's Please. done to everyone. <laughs> All right. Uh, your last two series were, were financed by European companies, um, I think, Borgia and, and Copper. Is it more conservative in America now than we might think? It, it's not conservative so much as it is this nervousness, this fear. Uh, and Hollywood has always been afraid, but the fear level is much larger. Um, uh, Borgia was definitely... Uh, uh, and it was a first in the regard that there was no American distributor going in when we started production. That was unusual. It was primarily financed by Canal Plus and, uh, and ZDF, primarily, primarily by Canal Plus. And then uh, Jan Moita, who runs Beta Film, sold it to 85 different countries. So uh, there, was, there was money coming in. Um, uh, Copper was funded by BBC America, uh, which was, we were, their, we were their first original programming. They had only been buying Doctor Who and other BBC products, series. Um, so, but they were trying to establish their own beachhead in, in America, because it, it is called BBC America. Um, so ours was the first show. So it was, technically it was funded by the mothership, BBC, but it, it was all done through uh, the American company, BBC America. Um, what do you think, when is a good time for a series to end? Because you don't want the audience to be exhausted, and right. surely if it's successful, you don't want to end it. Right. So how do you decide, do you have a main plot in your head and when it's finished you, you say, okay, it's finished, or how do you decide? Well, I, I think each series is, is different. Um, Borgia, um, they died. <laughs> so I, you know. And even though I, I, I occasionally believe in the resurrection, I, 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 I you know. Um, with with uh, Oz, I definitely wanted to end it um, at the point I ended it, uh, because I, I really felt that the core characters that we had established in the first season, uh, to, to have more bad things happen to them would make it start to feel uh, ridiculous, you know what I mean? And HBO said, well, just kill all them and bring in a whole bunch of new prisoners. But I liked the actors so much because they were so courageous and talented that I thought, well, I don't want to be sitting here without these people because they're, they're, they're terrific people. And I knew where I wanted it to end. I knew sort of the last statement I wanted it to make. Um, with, with Homicide, um, very quickly, with Homicide, um, I knew how I was going to end it, but I didn't know when because we, were, we would get renewed and so I'd have to delay the ending. But I finally did do the ending. And going all the way back to St. Elsewhere, we were constantly going to be canceled by NBC. I mean, literally, we, we, how we survived the number of seasons we survived, I don't know. But we had a list in the, in, in, uh, in the lunchroom where if you had an idea for a final episode, you'd write it on the list. 
So by the time we actually knew that we weren't coming back, we went into Bruce Paltrow and we pitched like 10 of the worst endings for television shows you could possibly imagine. I mean, they were absolutely insane. And he picked the one we did, and he said, and I said, you really like it? He goes, no, but it's not the worst one. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we ended St. Elsewhere. But you, ending Oz, you, you did something remarkable, because you made the last episode Exeunt Omnes, a Shakespearean stage direction quote, and you had it almost go on normally, mm -hmm. so to speak, um, except there was a lot of killing going on. And then suddenly a deus ex machina appeared in right. terms of a delivered anonymous package in the mail room, which they opened and it had anthrax. A anthrax. Yeah. And so everybody was evacuated in a bus. Exeunt omnes. Right. So was this the, the worst idea, the best idea, or was it? Well, that one, no, that was the idea. That was where I wanted, that's where I wanted to end the like show. sudden. Yeah, yeah. Because that was what all, Oz was all about, sudden. Yeah. You could not relax. You could not plan. No. Yeah. Things were going to change. No matter what happened, no matter what you did, mm -hmm. the, the, you had no control over the larger events that were going to go on in the prison. And the last image is somebody in a... De, uh, in a, a hazmat suit. Hazmat suit. Turning the lights off. That's Turning actually me. Off. Yeah, that's you. Yeah. 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 I, it's the only time I've ever, uh, I've ever acted... And all I did was have to wear this green hazmat suit and flick a switch and the lights went off and that was the end of the show. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I will let you into a secret. Um, um, you know, like anybody else, one's nervous if one's going to interview Tom Fontana in front of a public. And so I had to meet him for a drink yesterday just to warm ourselves up, so to speak. And uh, I, had my, I took my box of Oz up to Berlin and um, I, as I arrived in Berlin, I thought, oh, Shit, I better prepare for this. I mean, you know, I, I hadn't met him before, and I didn't realize he was a bourbon fanatic. And, uh, <laughs> um, uh, um, uh, so I was nervous. I, I, I know what I'll do. I just watched the last episode of Oz, and so I watched it and watched it. And I just got to the end as I had to leave for your hotel, and um, I, yeah, the, the man in the hazmat suit. Yeah, wait a minute. Mm, interesting. I wonder who that is. And then <laughs> I met him in the hotel, and then, of course, I realized that's why that was the last question. <laughs> Thank you very much. We're going for a drink. I think we're exactly on time. <laughs>